Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Fronteras, a changing America. I'm Anthony Moreno. According to a 2019 health indicator report on food insecurity in New Mexico by the Department of Health, in the state in 2017, one in six individuals and one in four children lived in homes without consistent access to adequate food needed for everyone to live healthy lives. That was before the pandemic. Roadrunner Food Bank has been working to get nutritional food to those in New Mexico who may be experiencing food insecurity. Our guest for this program is Roadrunner Food Bank President and CEO Mag Strittmatter. Mag, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the opportunity, Anthony. Really do appreciate it. We're into the pandemic. It's been over a year into this pandemic. I'd like to hear from you. What was it about our food system and our food chain that surprised you the most when the pandemic hit New Mexico? Well, I think like a lot of food banks across the country, we recognized how quickly a system can be broken by such a disruption. And, and granted, this is a 100 in a 100 year event, uh, a pandemic of the sorts that we've experienced but still it really exposed vulnerabilities within the food chain system. And that's one of the last places along with healthcare and, and, and other critical resources that you wanna see something like that happen. Uh, we experienced, uh, I would say in March, April, definitely into May, uh, delays of orders. When we started to see the number of people who were losing their work, the number of people who were uh, coming into vulnerability around food insecurity, we knew that we had to step up our game in order to get the food into the state that was needed to get out into communities across our very vast, uh, very vast state. And when we would place orders, we didn't anticipate early on that those orders would be either uh, outright um, canceled or we would experience three to eight to 12 week delays in receiving that food. People need food today. In many cases, they needed it yesterday. And the, the prospect of not getting that food into the state on a, in a timely fashion was just heartbreaking and devastating. But we had to continue to find ways to reach out to uh, contacts, to sources that could get the food into us. And so I think that of, of all things, in addition to everyone experiencing the toilet paper issues and and uh, some of those other type of shortages within the food chain system, it began to really impact us and make us wary and also wise to how we proceeded into the future as far as advance, uh, planning in advance and also understanding that the cost of food was going to be impacted by this as well. So we would have to really dig into our budgets to make sure that we had the, the resources available to expense the additional dollars it would take to buy the same 53 foot trailer of food that may have cost a fraction of what it was gonna cost us now. And especially as we do budgeting uh, in today's world, what we're planning for into the future. So there were a lot of, of things that really came to our attention around how fragile that food system is and how something like a pandemic can wreak havoc, especially when you're talking about trying to find nutritious food for food insecure populations in a state like New Mexico. Your organization relies on the help of many partners across the state and volunteers. When the pandemic hit New Mexico and impacted so many people, and there was still so much we didn't know about COVID-19, how did you adapt to being able to get food out to folks throughout the state? We had to change everything. Uh, we had become adept at and efficient at doing things a certain way, especially when it came to getting mass food out into communities through mobile food pantry distributions, where we would have the self-select model. Because of COVID, we had to stop that uh, type of farmer's market approach of doing food distribution, which lend itself to client choice. 
So we had to switch up how we were doing the distribution, but we always had to go back to square one, which was safety. Safety with respect to the food itself and how it was being handled, how it was being prepared, but also food uh, safety with respect to how our volunteers were uh, interacting and also how we were uh, getting the, dispensing the food to the recipients on the on the uh, the last mile. So how we were being respectful and uh, always and never forgetting the safety component of the food the volunteers, the staff, and the individuals receiving the food. So we had to change everything. In other words, we went from a more open system of uh, self-select to having to go back to pre-boxing thousands and thousands of boxes of food for that safety component. And then um, having that distribution on the other end look a little bit different for our recipients in that we, we did a drive-through system which required just a switching up how we did things, but always keeping safety as the number one component so that everyone from the beginning of the process to the very end of the process was included in that safety component. That drive-through system, I think photos of folks driving through to get food across the country is probably going to be something that we remember on how this, one of the reasons, one of the ways this pandemic impacted our country and also folks here in New Mexico. What other ways did uh, Roadrunner Food Bank have to adapt to this pandemic in order to continue its mission? Uh, we had to adapt in how we utilize volunteers, not just in the mobile distributions itself, but in the packing of that food. So on an average year, uh, Roadrunner would be blessed with the services and talents of some 25,000 volunteers which is what uh, the, the fuel it takes to uh, run the engine to make sure all the food is processed and prepared and then um, given out into the communities. What we had to do is uh, instead of having uh, groups coming into our warehouse where we did a lot in, in the Albuquerque warehouse where we did a lot of our prep, uh, instead of having you know groups of 70, 80 people at a time coming in to help, which was pretty typical, corporations bringing groups in, churches, communities bringing groups in, we had to cut that number in half so that we could continue to follow COVID uh, safety protocols. So that again, the volunteers were uh, operating within our confines in a safe ma manner. So we really had to do more with fewer volunteers. And so that was a way that we had to adapt and, and adjust. And also, as I mentioned earlier, how we were planning in our food uh, ordering process, how we were doing distribution, we had to add, uh, because we were having so much more impact in the, the amount of food that was needed in communities and the amount of food we were, we were getting in, we had to add additional drivers with additional routes so that we could continue to push and get that, that product out into the community. So we had to be very uh, nimble in our uh, response, not reaction. So we're trying to respond, but also think ahead so that we could uh, not put uh, the situations of very vulnerable populations at risk by our lack of preparedness. Uh, so we had to really be constantly thinking ahead in a way that would allow for us to be of service and to be as efficient and as effective as possible for people who are desperately in need of, of a very critical element of life, which is food. Now you rely on a lot of volunteers, some who may be considered in a vulnerable population. How did that play a role in impacting the people you had available to you? Exactly, the first, uh, the first signal for us that uh, our, populate, our, our volunteer bench would, would be uh, disrupted was when it was um, known or identified that those who were seniors uh, would, were at great risk for this disease. And as a result of that, so many of our uh, volunteers that come into us that are especially the regular volunteers that have a regular shift every week or every other week were seniors, they're retirees that had their gifts of talent to share with us. That is when we started to see a pullback of, of workforce that, that we had to be creative in how we were uh, filling the void. So oftentimes we would utilize staff in different roles that 
may or may not have had, uh, you know, the the you know, the, the job experience to do certain things, but we adapted uh, so that we could not have the uh, functionality and the production impacted by the fact that we were having a shift in the, the demographic of who our volunteers were. Uh, but we re really wanted to create an environment where the volunteers we did have that we were able to bring in um, would have a productive, positive experience and appreciated so that they would be willing and wanting to to return back to help us on an ongoing basis and i have to say people were so responsive and wonderful that way uh, it gave so much hope that that yes uh, communities were working together to really uh, put you know put our face into the headwinds and work on this together so that uh, at the end of the day we were accomplishing our goals and getting food to communities now, this may not be a surprise to you or other folks who work on issues related to food insecurity, but do you think a lot of people, not only in New Mexico, but across the country, were surprised at just how many folks became food insecure during this pandemic? It, it, I, when you were talking earlier about the, those lines of cars, uh, this was, that was a snapshot for us in 2020, 2021 that the food lines were in the great uh, the great uh, recession, the depression back in the in the 20s and the 30s, when you would see those pictures and you'd go, wow, I never thought that would be possible. The same type of thing, I think, was very stunning for many people to recognize how vulnerable we are as a society with respect to the amount of, of say savings that families have on average, what is it? How many households have less than $500 in savings? A situation like this where you had a job loss overnight and how that impacted not just those that you think that might be impacted, but across the board in so many different uh, business sectors that just like a flip of a switch, you, you had a job yesterday, you don't have a job today. And what do you do in the meantime uh, that that you have to uh, consider how you're going to take care of yourself and your family? So I think it was a stunning realization about what vulnerabilities we have as a society and how uh, being able to absorb and take on a blunt force trauma like this was uh, was very staggering. And for a, a great swath of our population that's that experienced it firsthand. Now, you deal with a lot of folks in the communities that you serve, uh, community leaders, policymakers. Do you feel that the conversation on food insecurity is changing right now in our country? To your point, there is so much more awareness about what it is, what it looks like, what it doesn't look like, and what are the solutions. So I think if anything, if you know, you're looking for silver linings as you go through something as devastating as this past year was, I think the level of awareness, the level of dialogue, the level of being open to saying, okay, I'm gonna drop my preconceptions about who hungry or food insecure people are and really look at it from a, a, a different lens. And then let's start talking collaboratively about solutions. So I, I think that was one of the wonderful blessings that we experienced this past year. So many people are having aha moments that were in leadership roles, whether it was in the you know a foundation world, uh, the the government world, uh, corporate world. That we're going, oh my God, how many of our employees are now experiencing food insecurity when we. We, we thought we, you know, we, we had to make cuts. We didn't anticipate that so many would be at risk. So I think it, it, has, it has changed, it has elevated. Uh, it has taken the deaf ear out of the conversation because I think for so long when we talked about food insecurity, people are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's not me, it's not my family. Uh, you know, so I'm not going to listen as much or I don't know what that means. Whereas now uh, more and more households were impacted by this and it, it just demonstrated how close to home it really hit. So as a result of that, people are much more sensitive and aware. Now you mentioned a little bit of this uh, just now, but I'd like to kind of dive in what you brought up. Uh, what does someone who is food insecurity in 2021 look like? Uh, let's who could see. they be? 
look at a picture of your family and look at a picture of your family in multi-generational terms. It could be your, your grandparents, it could be your uncles, your aunts, your siblings. It could be your nieces and nephews. It's 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 a slice and a swath across Americana. Uh, those who, uh, for whatever reason, now find themselves food insecure, and because so so much shifted so quickly in the uh, on the economic side last year with job reductions and job just devastating job losses, uh, I think that present that picture of, of who is now waiting in those food lines in their cars uh, it, it crosses a wider sense of demographic than I people I think people even ever thought possible uh, people who were in their nice sedans uh, that you would think well surely they're not having food insecurity well you know appearance is not always everything and we have to really look a little deeper it's like the old expression you know don't judge a book by its cover. Uh, there, there are a lot of components and reasons why, what goes into having food insecurity uh, impact different homes or households and why some are and why some may not be. Uh, but it really did open a lot of eyes to, to this issue. And for that, at least, um, you know, we have a better footing as to what we're going to do about finding solutions. And of course, when you're talking about food insecurity, let's talk about it from a broader sense. It is not, uh, it is more of a symptom of a greater, larger issue. And, and I think that some of the conversation came out over the last year around um, income in, in, uh, inequities. Uh, looking at what the wages are of, of certain sectors and what increases or what changes have to be made and not kid ourselves that uh, not having a uh, increase in the minimum wage for what is it now 12 years that we haven't had an increase that does that have an, in, uh, an impact on people's ability to maintain their 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 sense of uh, stability I, I think there are a lot of things that were exposed to this whole situation now, with the conversation um, being elevated and being amplified around food insecurity, let's talk about some possible solutions. What may be working? What's some, what are some promising things being done, uh, if not in New Mexico, in other states or in other countries dealing with this issue of food insecurity? Well, I, I just think the fact that we're getting out of silos and we're starting to talk to each other across across the board around how, what can be solutions that uh, say the for-profit world can can consider. Uh, what are some of the solutions that we need to look at it from a different paradigm from a governmental standpoint on policy, uh, and then also you know nonprofits taking a look at their own house in the houses and saying, well, what changes do we need to make in how we're assessing this issue or assessing the broader issue of poverty uh, and, and work more collaboratively together? Because this, this is, uh, hunger is not an issue that will be solved alone by the feeding nonprofit sector. It's going to have, it'll be impacted by other components and, and economic development comes into play with that. Uh, uh, again, uh, wage equity, uh, a, a myriad of topics that we didn't even, I, I would say, have the uh, fortitude to uh, say in public, let alone have a, a, a broader discourse like we are right now, which is really healthy. So I think from the standpoint of New Mexico, it's looking at how can we help ourselves help ourselves. So how can we do things better so that we can create an environment where there are more opportunities for people to uh, recover and move out of this and what that might look like. But with that said, we do know that a state like New Mexico that pre-pandemic, as you so aptly pointed out, had such high hunger rates uh, already. Uh, what is the sustained level of the current rates? What is the forecasting? What is that going to look like? And then, and then trying to understand what's the future? How long out? out into the future will this be projected as far as hunger and food insecurity in our state. It's not going to happen and improve overnight. It's going to take time. And it's also going to take this collaborative nature of working on, on uh, solutions to uh, alleviate uh, the additional food insecurity rate, let alone bringing it down 
uh, to uh, lower levels than what we had pre-pandemic. So there's a lot of work to be done. But I think awareness is a first, a really good first step and honesty about how, how we work together to address it. And a lot of people are talking to each other now that may not have wanted to have a conversation uh, even 18 months ago. So things have shifted that way, but there will be a lot of earnest hard work uh, ahead of us uh, in order to really address this issue. Okay, so we know the pandemic is obviously playing a role in impacting New Mexico and other states across the country. Now, what other threats face our food system and um, hunger, uh, you know, kind of help um, worsen hunger in our country? What are the other threats in 2021? What are we dealing with right now? Well, you know, one of the things that in the short term that we're going to be uh, keeping a very close eye on will be uh, a, a food shortage or even a uh, uh, energy shortage that may result this summer into the fall and maybe into the winter as a result of a transition within the workforce. Uh, for ex most specifically, having enough uh, CDL drivers to, it's not that we don't have necessarily the food, it is having enough of those drivers out there to move the product from point A to point B, whether it's food, whether it's petroleum products, you know, uh, making sure your local gas station has the gas that's supposed to get to the, into the different communities. So there are some workforce shifts that are happening that will and, and could impact the availability of, of, uh, of food. And for us, it's a double, it's a double edged sword because we, uh, as an organization that relies so much on transportation with our fleet of tractor trailers, we need to have access to uh, that fuel so that we can get our trucks to places all over the state. So that uh, in its own um, creates a, a, a conundrum that uh, we have to watch very closely and see what kind of trends, if those things are actually playing out. Uh, but uh, overall, it's, it's you know, looking at food systems, uh, you know, having something that just happened most recently about the cyber attacks within a, the, like the meat industry, which we, we, we saw just recently. What impact does that have in having um, that access to uh, protein sources uh, and making that food available throughout the food system, whether it's just at the local grocery store or having it available in the food relief, the hunger sector. So there's a lot of trickle down, um, run downhill kind of uh, issues that we're keeping a close eye on that could impact our availability within our region, within our country that might impact food, food systems as well. And then also not knowing about, uh, you know, this summer uh, with storms, uh, we, we know already with tornadoes, there've been some damage to crops in different parts of the South that is producing, that produces food uh, earlier in the calendar year. Uh, and then also keeping an eye on the hurricane season too. So that goes back to, weather that goes back to not just weather, but climate, most importantly, and how more severe these storms are that disrupt our food chain and the food systems, not just here in the United States, but also in Central America too, where a lot of, of product that uh, helps to feed America comes, comes through the food chain system too. So really keeping a close eye on those things and making sure that we're observing and watching and looking out for any of those type of shifts and changes that may seem subtle, that might cause disruptions. Okay, I wanna ask you kind of a hypothetical question. And what would your response be if the President of the United States called you up on the phone and said, Mag, I'm going to declare a war on food insecurity and I need your thoughts on what are some of the top issues we need to address in order to do this successfully? What would you tell the President? I, I would really encourage that you know, we, we look at the broader spectrum of, of issues, um, understanding what some of the problems are. Uh, you know, a state like ours is not, you know, we can't compare New Mexico to, uh, to other states uh, that have um, access to food because it's, you know, uh, agriculture, even though it's an important part of our state's economy, uh, we import far more than uh, food than we export. And uh, as far as the day-to-day -day type of food items, 
So we'd really have to look at what are some of those issues that are occurring within the state. And I would, you know, most definitely talk about, you know, the the disparate uh, uh, miles, you know, the, the, the separation between communities within a state as vast as New Mexico, and also address uh, those communities that of, uh, especially that of indigenous populations that don't have the infrastructure that some of other communities may have. We don't have a lot of refrigeration available within this state so that we could um, push product and get it out across into communities that can have it uh, become more of a stable source of food. So there are there are a lot of issues around that that are very centric and specific to locale. And, and talking about New Mexico it would be uh, looking at um, a, a state that usually has a higher unemployment rate, uh, uh, has a has notably a high food insecurity rate um, and uh, ed education opportunities, all of those things in economic development. What are those things that can help uh, enrich and deepen that? Because again, food insecurity and hunger is a symptom of something much larger. And so we have to always back up and say, what are we solving for? Um, and so those type of conversations have to be part of the dialogue or else we're just kidding ourselves and food insecurity will continue on for decades to come. Okay. Mag Strip Matter is president and CEO of Roadrunner Food Bank. Mag, thank you so much for joining us for the program. Thank you. And we want to thank you for joining us for another episode of Fronteras at Changing America. I'm Anthony Moreno. We'll see you next time.